Welcome. Uh, welcome to uh, Books on Faith and Meaning. My name is Matt Crossman. I am the uh, Faith Initiative Director here at the Grace Farms Foundation. I'm so glad that you can uh, join us uh, this afternoon. Um, first of all, just a, a, only a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, this meeting will be recorded, uh, just so you know. And um, you're welcome to use the Q&A function um, throughout. Uh, we'll be monitoring that and uh, hope to respond to as many of your questions as we can. Uh, do go ahead and get those in early. I'll be sort of trying to watch that and see if um, see how they might weave into our conversation. You know, the, the faith initiatives question is um, really our, our, our focal point, and, and it's this question, what is the shape of flourishing life? And for this series, for this book series, what we're, what we're doing is we're asking, how can these texts help, how can these texts help us make progress in our quest to answer this question? Now, this series assumes that reading is not enough, but the texts, we think, can give us access to people, to histories, to ideas that if we allow them to do their work on us can contribute substantially to our quest. Theodor Adorno insisted in Minimum Moralia, he said, there is no true life within a false life. His, stern, his is a stern warning to those of us who would ask the question of the shape of flourishing life in times such as ours. And what can it mean to ask the question of the shape of flourishing life in this moment, just days after the storming of the US Capitol by white nationalists on the eve of an inauguration threatened by further violence, days after lest it get lost in the shuffle prosecutors declined to press charges against the officers involved in the shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. If any are looking for flourishing life within these realities, within the white supremacy that animates them, and surely those who stormed the Capitol and those who cheered them were and are doing just that, they're profoundly mistaken and lost in deep moral error. If we're looking for flourishing life as an escape from these realities, we hope in vain. Private happiness aloof from social calamity is false hope, unlikely to be achieved and a moral calamity where and when it can be achieved. And yet, in another sense, we know that true life is possible within or perhaps better in the midst of the false. The storming of the Capitol happened the day after Raphael Warnock was elected. The man who preaches in Martin Luther King Jr.'s pulpit will now represent Georgia in the United States Senate, the first black senator from the state. And I can't help but want to read Warnock's election as, among other things, a vindication of King's legacy, which yesterday we paused to remember and honor. King's legacy is, of course, the legacy of the movement of women, men, and children whom he led and whom his name has come to represent. Their lives represent the very real possibility of true life in the midst of the false. True life lived as a testimony against the falseness of white supremacy. As my colleague Willie James Jennings has said, such communities give rise not to private happiness, but to shared communal joy contra mundum joy against, not within or aloof from, a world distorted by white supremacy. At a moment such as this, we are fortunate to have the wisdom of Howard Thurman. No doubt some of the story of resistance I just sketched all too briefly, that that, that story itself was set in motion by the book that we have for today, Jesus and the Disinherited. And whether or not we locate ourselves within the Christian tradition out of which Thurman is writing, there are profound insights here, I think, about what it means to seek true life in the midst of false life. And to introduce us to Thurman's work and to discuss it, we're fortunate also to have with us Professor Xavier Pickett. Professor Pickett is Assistant Professor of Religious Studies and Africana Studies at North Carolina State University. And prior to joining NC State, he was an assistant professor at New York University in the Department of Religious Studies and held a residential doctoral fellowship at the University of Virginia's Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies. His research focuses on African American religion, 
politics, emotions, and social movements like Black Power and Black Lives Matter. He's also working on a new theory of Black rage, to which I hope we will turn before our time is up. Professor Pickett, Xavier, if I may, uh, I'm so glad that you're here with us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. And it's good to, to be in conversation with you and, um, and with the audience. So <laughs> there's so much that we could talk about in this book. I wonder if as we start, um, you know, th th this book has a, has a sort of evocative structure. It, he, uh, Thurman begins with uh, what he calls just an interpretation of Jesus, this uh, crucially important religious fi uh, figure, but historical figure. And he's doing something interesting with history. We'll come back to that in a second. And then he goes on to talk about these sort of three interior states and the ways that these interior states are themselves shaped by and might, um, might have something to say about the external situation in which we find ourselves. And then he goes on to, to give an account of, of love, to take it as his proposal for sort of a way forward. I don't know if we could start with, starting with his interpretation of Jesus. There's, there's something familiar here to me, but really, really powerful in what he's doing. He's, he proposes a sort of radical reading of Jesus, namely reading Jesus in his actual material historical context. Um, and, and he highlights, I feel like in, in the midst of doing, of, or sort of reading Jesus' historical context that way, he's, he's actually reading our context or his context. Uh, we have some continuity with his context. Um, I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about like how, how, what sort of Jesus is Thurman giving us and how is he in, encouraging us to sort of read and understand this figure? Yeah, no, it's an important question. Um, if I am looking down, it's because I have Thurman here with me. And um, I, 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 I'm, I want to kind of tackle that question, if I may, with some of the words of Thurman. I think how Thurman begins the, his book are so, is so powerful in the preface. I mean, really the preface and the, um, the beginning of the first chapter um, on Jesus and interpretation, I mean, either one of those are, are, are just splendid places to, to begin. Um, but um, it's, it's so hard to talk about Thurman, this particular text without offering some of Thurman's words. And so if I may, I think your audience perhaps would appreciate hearing some of Thurman um, to whet their appetites. Um, so here's how Thurman begins the preface um, here. He says, the significance of the religion of Jesus to people who stand with their backs against the wall. This is a, a, a key metaphor for Thurman on the backs up against the wall has always seemed to me to be crucial. You know, he says, it is one emphasis which has been lacking except where it has been part of the very unfortunate corruption of the missionary impulse, which in a sense, the very heartbeat of the Christian religion. So Thurman is coming out of the gate. I mean, as someone want to say, swinging and, um, and, and making some very particular cr critiques of how Christianity has been understood and interpreted and received you know, um, in Europe, or particularly in the US. Um, but then he goes on to press a little bit more and say, um, where he, he begins to locate himself here. He says, my interest in the problem has been and continues to be both personal and professional. So listen, this is this is not just a clinical sort of dispassionate objective sort of reading of, of, of Jesus here. Like there is something that is at stake for me as a person. And we can, and we're going to get into some of that stuff, I'm sure, undoubtedly in this conversation. But Thurman says, this is the question which individuals and groups who live in our land always under the threat of profound social and psychological displacement face. And this is the question that Thurman raised. Why is it that Christianity seems so impotent to deal radically and therefore effectively with issues of discrimination, injustice on the basis of race, religion, and national origin? Is this impotency due to the betrayal of the genius of religion or is it due to the basic weakness in religion itself? All right, so Thurman is really raising um, a question that He's not the first to raise it altogether, but he's probably the first to raise it in this kind of way and this particular moment and historically, you know, because, um, you know, what, what is happening here in the early 20th century, you know, not get into too much of the weeds, 
but uh, you know, a lot of scholarship, German scholarship around Jesus, um, you know, there is, you know, usually a kind of, and this sort of dichotomy has been sort of disabused um, now, but it kind of distinction between the historical Jesus and the Christ of faith, for instance. Um, and so, and at this particular moment, early 20th century, there's attempts to try to recover, you know, the historicity of Jesus. And, and Thurman is interested in that project as well, but he's interested in it, you know, uh, from the standpoint actually of wanting to press it further than many European um, biblical scholars, New Testament scholars particularly, um, beyond where they was pressing. That is to say that there's something about not just historical location of Jesus that's significant, but also about the person of Jesus, his body, you know, um, his makeup, his phenotype, all these sorts of things, his status in that society. And so Thurman articulates really sort of three sort of features of uh, try to try to offer really a reinterpretation of Jesus um, that that is really critical for 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 the reader to understand. One one of which is that Jesus that the intervention that Thurman makes that Jesus is a Jew. That's one point that Thurman sort of uh, makes, and this is important. It's important claim because you know as Christianity has um, has developed quite significantly you know, as after it's left Africa and has like transformed itself and, and, is, and, and, and in a very powerful way have become embed, embedded with empire, right? Become a part of various sort of European empires, uh, particularly in the third, fourth, fifth century and forward. Um, and so we can forget that, that Jesus is actually not a Christian, right? And so that he's actually is a Jew, but Thurman goes on to say that he's also poor. All right, so he's not so he he's not Jesus wasn't born as, as some upper class or arist, aristocrat and these sorts of things, you know, didn't have a lot of money, all that kind of stuff. And so he was poor, but he was also, as Thurman says, the other third point that Thurman says he's he's actually belonged to what Thurman's language is a minority group, you know, which we would want to describe in our in our language. It's kind of a minoritized group. And so part of what they help us to see is that, that Jesus is actually a first century Palestinian Jew, right? And so that, that in some ways he's not a Roman citizen. He's, he, 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 he doesn't have the empire on his side. So he's actually being crushed by the empire, right? And so um, many Jews at that time were. So Thurman is, Thurman, Thurman is trying to say, okay, if that's, historical Jesus, that's the context in which he was situated, you know, he actually belonged to this particular sort of like class of people who were minoritized and the economic class being poor. Thurman Dins basically says, hmm, well, we can make some interesting sort of analogies to, to that particular, you know, group of people there in the first century to to, to people who are in the US, uh, particularly African-Americans, but also a lot of people who are the disinherited, the dispossessed um, across, across the land and across time. And so that maybe Jesus might have something to say something to them. And so now I'll make this last point. And part of, part of this intervention that Thurman is trying to make, he's actually trying to, to uh, he's actually trying to to retrieve, but in the process of retrieving, he's also trying to um, to unclench the kind of Jesus that 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 it has really masqueraded and, and has purported itself to be sort of um, uh, the historical Jesus away from all kinds of white supremacist interpretations that don't go by that sort of description. And so, just so happened, how is it the case that Jesus still happens to be white for most people? Right, and the imaginations of most people, right? And Thurman is trying to is trying to sort of push back against that and say, well, actually, no, Jesus actually is not white. He's actually brown, you know. And so, and what then does that mean for how we understand him? And so, what, so what, so so part of the link that he wants to to draw here between sort of the Jews who are dark and black folks who are themselves also um, dark. And so, and what this what this allows Thurman, the last point I wanted to make, and we can sort of talk about this more, is 
this allows them to be able to draw a really critical distinction between the religion of Christianity and the religion of Jesus. Because religion of Christianity is a religion of the dominant, those who are in power, right? But the religion of Jesus are those who are actually, you know, uh, what's been said sort of underneath, at least for our moment, modernity, right? And so, um, and Thurman is trying to give an account of, of that. Well, how, how is it that these group of people who are, who are marginalized, who are poor, who are, who are, who are, who are, who are seen as, as, as outsiders, how is it that these group of people, these particular Jews, and, and a, a particular central figure that emerged known as, as Jesus of Nazareth, how is it that this particular individual and these, and these people around him, um, how is it that they live? How is it that he has lived this life that is being Jesus, right? As opposed to, to those who try to lay claim to Jesus, right? Um, and, and sort of, and, and then and infuse Jesus and the sort of teachings around him um, with, with sort of domination and empire and, and all kinds of institutions that, that try to exclude the very people that Jesus actually, not just represent, that actually is. Mm. That's the kind of irony in a way that Thurmanist wants to sort of push back against. That's fantastic. It's really, really helpful the way you've laid that out. You know, in many ways, I think this reminds me of and I suppose the, the inheritance is the other direction, but it reminds me of some of what James Cone is doing in The Cross and the Lynching Tree, right? In which Cone is suggesting that American Christians haven't understood the cross of Christ, precisely the historical cross of Christ e even, right? The, the, not, not an abstract sort of philosophical, I'm making some sort of theological claim, but the actual material cross of Christ until they recognize it in the American lynching tree, until you say Jesus was lynched. As an American Christian, you haven't understood um, what historically um, took, took place in this event of the crucifixion that Christians, that white Christians regularly want to make appeal to and want to remain blind to any sort of connection that that might have to the racialized context in which we're doing this interpretation. That's just for what it's worth, like a, a conversation, a question that came up in this, in the conversation that we had in this space about that book, a question that has been haunting me ever since, ever since, since then said, how can you get evangelicals, I, I, I'm ordained by a denomination that ostensibly I think would be called evangelical, I have troubles with that word um, these days, but um, how, are you, how, how could you ever get evangelicals to read Cone, to, to read Thurman, to, to, take, to take these sorts of claims seriously? And I, in, in the moment, it struck me as, why it's haunted me is it struck me that, well, Cone's trying to just read historically, like read well, like do, do his historical, which evangelicals claim to, to, be, to be wanting to do. There sh this should be a sort of receptivity here to try to, to try to read Jesus in his original context and make a connection from that context to the world that we live in. I, I think I know the answer, but like, uh, why is that obvious? Why is that obvious connection? like impossible for, um, for many evangelicals to make. Why is there, yeah, why, th th this, this question keeps haunting me. And, and, is there, and are there any sort of ways forward to like bring this, this reading of Jesus sort of into broader, certain parts of uh, American religious imagination? Yeah, I mean, Thurman is, is, is quite, I mean, this is in many ways the question that Thurman is, you know, could be understood to be taken up because you know, he begins the first, that first chapter I read from the preface, the beginning of the preface, but he begins the first chapter acknowledging that there are multiple interpretations of Jesus. Mm -hmm. All right. And so that's important to understand because if there's multiple varied interpretations of Jesus, then how do we make a determination? You know, and, and Thurman begins, you know, he, he says, you know, I'll just, you know, you know, read this, the, the first couple of sentences where he says, um, Many and varied are the interpretations dealing with the teachings and life of Jesus of Nazareth, but few of those interpretations deal with what the teaching and life of Jesus have to say to those who stand at a moment in human history with their backs up against the wall. And so, so Thurman is, is really sort of, again, you know, uh, you know, dropping the gauntlet, as it were, by saying that how is it that 
we can have an interpretation of Jesus, an understanding even of his teachings, that does not address those whose backs up against the wall, because Jesus himself back was up against the wall. He was actually crucified by the state. And so, so an interpretation of Jesus that cannot account for the very life and depth of Jesus and the way in which he died is like, well, how, do, like, how does that make sense? So, so Thurman is saying, well, are you sure you talking about Jesus or, you know, at least the Jesus who were in first century Palestine, right? And so, and I mean, he goes on to say, I mean, because the question is so important. I mean, Thurman is well aware that many of our interpretations are so inflected by and so influenced by, Thurman says, by the sin of pride, right? Arrogance, right? That we think because the tradition that I've inherited, the understanding that I personally possess, it must be actually the interpretation, the capital T, right? As if there is no other perspective, right? And Thurman wants to say, well, if your, if your, if, if your interpretation informed by sort of arrogance, self-righteousness, then Thurman says, we've actually seen the results of your Jesus and in the hands of your people who take themselves to be Christian with that particular Jesus. And we have seen that has been led to all kinds of um, practices of domination, you know, um, like slavery, but also like you were mentioning, you know, a few minutes ago, uh, Matt, is, is around lynching. I mean, and Thurman is writing this in the context of lynching. Black people are being lynched when he's writing this. In fact, he's preaching in churches, white churches being monitored, and in some ways black churches, but definitely preaching in churches being monitored by the KKK. So, I mean, this, so who are themselves in many cases are Christian. And so, I mean, what, what most people don't really sort of maybe recognize or know is that many members of the KKK were pastors, ministers, you know, elected officials, law enforcement. This is obviously, I will hope it may be obvious, it's not new news to most people now because we like, we can actually see sort of current sort of like day um, in some ways um, reenactments, uh, wittingly or unwittingly, of that same era now. And so Thurman is saying, how is it that those people claim to be Christian yet acting in that way, you know, you know, you know, dominating, you know, oppressing, you know, their sister, their brothers, you know, while at the very same time claiming to be, you know, of Christian, claiming to be of God's children, claiming that everybody is God's children, all these sorts of things. And so Thurman is is really wanting to raise some really important question. And there's, there's a fascinating moment uh, where Thurman, you know, says um, where he was really, he was really um, asked this, um, is, 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 if you will indulge me one more time, this, I mean, just the first few pages of, of this text is just so powerful. It's hard not to, to want to read some of this. And so he, he gives an account where he's, he's, he's having a conversation with, um, with someone and they ask him, how is he holding on? Like, how are you still a Christian? You know, given the history of Christianity, particularly in the U.S., and how Christians, particularly white Christians, have actually enslaved black Christians. How is it that you can, can still claim to be a Christian? How is it that you still can, can lay claim and have even some interest in this figure of Jesus? And, uh, and so, so Thurman says, like, you know, we drank over coffee and silence and after service, you know, had removed. He said to me, what are you doing over here? I know what the newspapers say about a pilgrimage of friendship and the rest. But that is not my question. What are you doing over here? This is when Thurman had traveled, you know, uh, at this point, you know, um, traveled a lot of places, you know, to India, et cetera. And, um, and so he's being sort of um, questioned here. And he says, no, what are you doing here? This is what I mean. And this is more than, this is not, this is Thurman quoting sort of this, his interlocutor. He says, more than 300 years ago, your forefathers were taken from the Western coast of Africa as slaves. The people who dealt in the slave traffic were Christians. The one of your famous Christian hymn writers, Sir John Newton, made his money from the sale of slaves to the new world. He is the man who wrote How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds and Amazing Grace. I'm familiar with these particular sort of hymns. There may be others, but these are the only ones I know. The name of one of the famous British slave vessels was Jesus. That was the title of the slave ship. So this is, this is what Thurman Interlocutor is saying. He said, these men 
who brought the slaves were Christians, Christian ministers, quoting the Christian apostle Paul, gave sanction of religion to the system of slavery. Some 70 years ago or more, you were freed by a man who was not a professing Christian, but rather the spearhead of a certain political, social, economic forces, the significance of which he himself did not understand. During all of the period since you have lived in a Christian nation in which you were segregated, lynched and, um, and burned, even in the church, I understand this segregation. One of my students who went to your country sent me a clipping telling about a Christian church in which the regular Sunday service was interrupted so that many could join a mob against one of your fellows. We just saw a mob, right? And Thurman is in the locker that ends that says this, he says, when he had been caught and done to death, they came back to resume their worship to their Christian God. The mob that, that, that's being referenced here is a lynch mob. So that, so these folks were, I mean, many of the people, who, you know, these white supremacists, nationalists, and these are more, more self-avowed, more overt kind. White supremacy is, 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 is not just those who put on robes, not those who just march on the Capitol, not those who march in Charlottesville. I was in Charlottesville, by the way, in, in 2017 in Virginia when they came through there. And so um, they walked with their tiki torches past my office. All that is say is what Thurman is, what Thur what Thurman is learning us to is that, that these group of individuals, they would go to church and then as a part of their part of their worship, really, they will go out and lynch people. And so, I mean, part of part of what we have to really understand and, and really wrap our minds around is that how is it that many white Christians could, could go out and lynch people really as a part of as a, as a part of their religious expression? And so, because lynching, as we understand it, particularly now on, on this side of things, was really an extension of white Christian worship. And so it was a part of their religious rituals. You know, so they would go to church on 11 a.m. on Sunday and, and after church, go go attend a lynch mob and, and go back to their regular business of, of, of Sunday sort of fellowship. And Thurman is really is really trying to wrestle with um, like how is it that that these people um, interpretation of Jesus is a legitimate interpretation. And so and that just, you know, leads him to sort of to offer a, a, a reinterpretation. Of, of Jesus that is as much more sort of like holistic and accounts for the person that is that is being interpreted Jesus in a much more sort of fuller and complex light. Yeah. And yet in the face of all this, I mean, this is and this is exactly what the interlocutor is, is pressing him on. Thurman finds resources for resistance in the person of Jesus and in, I mean, among other places, but but in the Sermon on the Mount, um, in, in a lot of in Jesus' teachings of love of enemy, of, um, of nonviolence. Um, and, and how, I, help, 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 us, help us understand. Um, I'll tell you, I, I think I mentioned this to you when we were talking um, a week or two ago. When I taught this text at Yale Divinity School, um, a lot of students found that really, really troubling. They, 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 they were worried that, that Thurman was not, not, not nearly radical enough um, in sort of turning to some of these really dangerous texts. And we know, I, I, I assume, we know how, how, how these texts can be abused to, uh, you know, love your enemy, meaning if I make myself your enemy by abusing you, you have to take it, right? Um, and yet Thurman's turning to these texts, um, and I take it producing, getting something out of it that isn't passive acquiescence isn't some sort of um, perverse celebration of martyrdom. Um, what sort of ethic is, is, he, is he proposing, is he finding in that, um, in the Sermon on the Mount, in some of these teachings? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, an, it's a really important question. It's, 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 a, it's a thorny one um, for a, a whole host of reasons. Um, I mean, one, I mean, one, one, one question that it raised, um, and I mean, and, and Thurman is really maybe could be understood as kind of engaged in the kind of experiment, as it were, like, can Christianity really be salvage? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and Thurman, you know, is, 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 in, is in some ways optimistic. And of course, but he's optimistic, not, be, not Christianity as the way in which has become sort of a religion of domination. 
but sort of the ethic that that is reflected in Jesus, like that has become identified, mis- actually has 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 sort of been obscured by the religion of, of, of Christianity. And so I think, yeah, I mean, a number of ways we can go with this, I think, you know, is to say that um, that Thurman does not believe, or to say it maybe more positively, that Thurman, Thurman really believes that, that what Jesus has to offer is not all of what white people say uh, about Jesus, <laughs> right? So like, and, and in some ways he has like, you know, firsthand and secondhand experiences of this. I mean, cause Thurman, you know, was born not that far from slavery. I mean, Thurman's grandmother was a slave you know, who herself was a Christian. And, but she was a Christian of a different type because most people think about, you know, enslaved, you know, um, African-Americans as being sort of docile, just kind of just passive, you know. And Thurman is saying, particularly from his grandmother, he, she, she taught him that's like, no, actually, you know, the Christianity that we understand and Jesus that we sort of um, believed in is not, the same Jesus of, of, uh, of the slave master. In fact, it's what Frederick Douglass have said, you know, in a number of places that there's a difference between the Christianity of the land and the Christianity of Christ, which is to say there's a difference between, this is Douglass as well, a Christianity that's on top of, the, on, the, on a deck of the slave ship, and there's a Christianity below deck. Mm. So Thurman is trying to give an account, is that how are these people understanding Jesus? Because like, if you only think about Jesus from the standpoint of those who are in power, those who are on top, those who are dominating, then you're going to miss a lot of stuff. And so, so Thurman saying that, that if you understand it from this perspective, from, from below, then actually, you know, there might actually be some resources here that, that were, that have not been brought into view, yeah. you know, and part of just a single out one of that, you know, in case, you know, the viewers might, might be curious, you know, there's a, another wonderful sort of uh, passage that, when Thurman is talking about his grandmother here, um, yeah, it's just it's, it's a really it's a really powerful moment. Um, there's a couple of a couple of passages here, but one of what Thurman says here, um, talking about you know when a lot of enslaved sort of uh, people of African descent when they sort of heard sort of sermons from from preachers, particularly sort of even black sermon, black preachers, but also even white preachers, typically they will always underscore, you know, by the end of the sermon that slaves obey your master, slaves obey your master, that sort of thing. And so, uh, but a number of black preachers, particularly there, um, you know, really before and after the civil, before and after the civil war, really, um, what, what reaffirm, you know, something else, and, and, and this is what Thurman recounts uh, from his conversations with his grandmother, I think it might be really important. He says, um, when I was a youngster, um, let me go back just a, a, a paragraph, I think that the rear viewer might appreciate here. The question has to do with like, it's about who I am, uh, what am I, and this sort of thing. This question has to do with the basic self um, estimate a profound sense of belonging, of counting. If a man, this is in the fear chapter, by the way, I'm reading from, if a man feels that he does not belong in, in the way in which it is perfectly normal for other people to belong, then he develops a sense of insecurity. When this happens to a person, it provides a base, the basic material for what the psychologist calls an inferiority complex. It is quite possible for a man to have no sense of personal inferiority as such, but at the same time to be dogged by a sense of social inferiority. The awareness of being a child of God here tends to stabilize the ego and results in a new courage, fearlessness, and power. And he says, I have seen it happen again and again. And then he says this, and does one more, he says, when I was a youngster, this was drilled into me by my grandmother. The idea was given to her by a certain slave minister who on occasion held secret religious meetings with his fellow slaves how everything in me quivered with the pulsing tremor of raw energy when in her recital, she would come to the triumphal climax of the minister. And the minister would say, you, you are not niggers. You, you are not slaves. You are God's children. 
disestablish for them the ground of personal dignity so that a profound sense of personal worth could be absorbed, could absorb the fear reaction. This alone is not enough, but without it, nothing else is of value. And so, so what Thurman is, Thurman is saying, listen, that that when, when Black people understood, and slave people in particular understood that they were God's children, contrary to white Christian slave owners and non-slave owners had to say, and when they said otherwise, and they understood themselves to be made in the image of God, to be God's children, to look like God. And so then that actually helps to reorient them, to, to, to help them to understand that, that, well, actually who I am is actually a reflection of what God looks like. That God is actually not just his reflection of, of me, but actually is working in me, is actually is a part of who I am. And, and this actually be, begins to, to sort of to, to reconfigure and transform the types of claims of like you being a slave, you being a nigger slave. And so so here there's a type of transvaluation here that 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 Thurman is really engaged in. Is he's negate is a negation of the negation. That, that you've been said that you're not a human, that you're less than human, that you're an animal. But, but Thurman says that you actually are not that. You're not the not that what they say you are. And so, and it is actually that becomes a way to sort of, to, to redefine, you know, one's inner self. How one see oneself is not just through the lens of someone else, but you start seeing yourself through the eyes of someone bigger than yourself who created everything. Mm. And that, that becomes a, a, a new sort of grounding and a new sort of orientation, you know, um, to, to be able to, to survive in, 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 a, in a loveless world. Yeah. It, it's been said that, that King carried two books with him at all times, the, the Bible and Jesus and the Disinherited. In what you're describing there, you can be, begin to see how the sort of impact that this way of thinking, this sort of connection of what's happening in the interior, how might how might one prepare in order to enter in in non in nonviolent resistance? How might one enter enter in? How might one engage in a world marked by white supremacy um, in ways that are grounded in something other than the lies that that white supremacy has has tried to instill in 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 the individual? Um, what help me understand like how how much of sometimes Thurman's read is only is sort of like oh well this is like the primer to King, um how much of this is like oh yeah because I can see I can make that those connections that seems really powerful right oh yeah you can see the sort of be, the 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 seeds or not even the seeds but really some of the technique and the interior work of Kingian nonviolence um um in in this text, um but at the same time Thurman can end up being misread if he's only only read in light of King so. Um, Help, help, help me both see the connections, help us see both the connections to, to King and I'll, maybe some of, the, some of the ways that what Thurman's doing is, is importantly different. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, you know, I mean, it's really important and I'm, you know, thank you for that sort of question because it's, it's really important to, so although, you know, yesterday was sort of, um, you know, the King holiday, you know, is I mean, Thurman wrote an incredible amount of, you know, stuff, I mean, you know, uh, probably arguably more than King, really. So, um, you know, obviously he had a shorter life that is King compared to Thurman. And so, um, so, so Thurman, you know, has a lot to say independently of King, you know, because King Thurman was born before King. In fact, you know, Thurman and King's dad, um, MLK Sr., you know, him, Thurman and, and MLK Sr. were classmates together in undergrad at Morehouse College. And so, um, so there's, there's a lot of like similarities, a lot of sort of in some similar streams and some, some traditions. Um, but part of what Thurman, you know, particularly in Jesus Disinherited, what it does is that it, it opened up a new way of thinking about Jesus in a way that, that wasn't as available to, to um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., um, at that time. And so, I mean, undoubtedly there was, you know, um, you know, social gospel sort of, um, you know, teachings that was proliferating in the early 20th century. Um, but it had not yet been sort of paired. We have not yet think about sort of, um, that kind of social, um, expansion of the gospel 
with these sorts of other questions that 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 Thurman was beginning to raise, you know, politically and and and, and socially and psychologically. I mean, it is definitely tempting to to read Thurman as as just preoccupied with uh, interiority, the inner life, and that sort of thing. And and undoubtedly, he is that. You know, um, I mean, there is a kind of uh, mysticism that runs through him, for instance. Um, that is, sort is, of is spirituality is, of social action, it seems. In exactly. And that's really powerful. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and this is why I think Thurman is actually still is still needed, because if you have social, if you have people who are acting to do right, but who themselves are not right, mm. you see, then we have, again, the makings of disaster, because I mean, there's plenty of folks, plenty of activists, you know, Twitter universe and all these sort of people, everybody wants to to present themselves as being on the side of justice, on the side of righteousness, but who are themselves unrighteous. So the question of like character, your interiority, your, your moral life is, 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 is not something that can be easily brushed aside, you know? And so social action apart from some measure of personal piety, right? You know, um, and having some measure of kind of like moral character, like once you start separating you know, like political action, political criticism, social criticism from like from the self, and the, the very people who actually are doing the the criticism of political work themselves, then you actually have created a you actually have re reproduced in many ways some of the very problems you know that 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 were found in Europe, you know, with with, with a lot of German sort of thinking, you know, um, you know, in the you know the nineteenth century, twentieth century, or so. There's a kind of bifurcation that Thurman you know, isn't willing to to completely sort of separate, he's not willing to completely separate, you know, the, the self and the, and the social. So he wants to really think them both. And so, and he's trying to think them both on a lot of, a lot of different axes that, that could be seemingly, you know, um, uh, much more sort of like kumbaya type of thing. But Thurman actually is open to the possibility of, of violence. And mm -hmm. so, like this is a lot of things that people don't know about Thurman. Thurman is not, you know, he's not an absolutist about this stuff whatsoever. You know, I mean, there's some interesting sort of like accounts where Thurman himself had to stand on guard at a house when he was traveling, you know, um, you know, because he was there was word about, you know, uh, the Klan and other sort of um, a white mob come and, and, and burn the house down or come and shoot out the house. And so there was patrols you know, when Thurman was was in the area when he was traveling or where he was living, that that in many cases that he, there was a gun around or people that was around him might have been armed. Same thing with King. You know, uh, I mean, I mean, King was not. You know, uh, I put this way, King was protected by people who were who were armed. So, um, so, so, so the, so the question about like armed self defense. You know, there's always a tendency to, to want to draw a wedge between, you know, love and, and arms of defense, you know, and what Thurman is trying to understand that really, I mean, Thurman's really subversive. I mean, I mean, people, I think the challenge around this Jesus and this inherit is that people aren't reading Thurman slowly enough. Thurman is a, if you ever hear Thurman, he's very slow and deliberate. It's just, he takes his time. I mean, silence is, is, is one of the, one of the things that, that, that is, um, that sort of mark his 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 delivery, and so and so reading him, you have to kind of take your time and stop because there's a lot of subversiveness that's happening, you know, throughout Jesus and disinherited, you know, like even deception. You know, we might think of deception as one of the chapters of Thurman. You might think of deception as being wrong, and Thurman is saying, well, actually, deception is actually neither positive nor 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 negative in a way. It's, it's kind of how do you Thurman is, is interested in. In, in this understanding deception as a way to respond to a terrible situation. How does one survive in a, in a context that is death dealing, death dodging, you know, particularly for others who, who are white, like how does one survive in that context? Well, you, part of what Thurman is suggesting that deception actually points as a kind of counter ideology, you know, like it's, it is a tactic of resistance. So, I mean, Thurman is not just, you know, uh, saying, hey, just love everybody hold hands and go out for, you know, a smoothie, a cup of coffee type of thing. You know, no, Thurman is concerned about protecting not just one's body, not just one sort of 
externalities, but actually protecting one's inner self against the violence of, of, of white supremacy that tries to that tries to make itself try to um to try to penetrate in one's interiority in a way to try to redefine oneself against you know what God has already said you are you know and so so to be able to maintain a type of sense of self in a world that says you are not a self that you are a nobody and and how did one go about doing that Thurman is 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 probably for our likes, depending on where our political sensibilities are, he's more interested in, in kind of preserving or at least sort of articulating the significance of, um, of, 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 of developing and maintaining and cultivating that sort of inner life that, 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 is not, that has not already been overdetermined by, by things and individuals that are without, that are on outside of you. And to, to just to, to draw out that point one step further, he or, or to, he's speaking not just to folks with their backs against the wall. He thinks if you start there, then you can start to understand the message. But what the message then has to say is it actually does also speak to those who are in positions of, of power, especially those, I take it, who might want to um, live in some ways as allies, to, to also attend to what white supremacy is doing to their um, interior life. So in that same chapter on fear, the fear that segregation, I, we could say white supremacy, but the, the fear that segregation inspires among the weak in turn breeds fear among the strong and the dominant. This fear insulates the conscience against a sense of wrongdoing in carrying out a policy of segregation. It, it sorry, <laughs> this fear insulates the conscience against a sense of wrongdoing in carrying out a policy of any white supremacist policy. For it counsels that if there were no white supremacy, if there were no segregation, there would be no protection against invasion of the home, the church, the school, etc. So, so just one of, again, to whet the appetite um, for, for folks in the audience, there are, the, there are multiple moments where, where Thurman is, is trying to demonstrate, look, white supremacy is poison for the soul of, of, of white supremacists as well. Just, just make sure we, 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 we get that. You have your, if you are, and, and you are necessarily entangled in white supremacy, we're in a sort of racialized world where, where, this, where these are the realities. Here's this thing that you should attend to in, 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 your, in yourself. And what I, what, I find, what I find powerful there, and um, we, we do have a question from Q&A, so I wanted to see if I can like, um, get, get here to it, but um, maybe first you give me a, a, a response here. Um, that attending to the interior life just seems so necessary to me for, for any of the sort of work of, of anti-racism, any, any of the sort of work of, um, of, of, of liberation, of transformation of soul. Of, but, it, but it's also this, this subtle place where we can actually get a, a, a sense of, we can see what these systems are sort of doing to us. As a, as a white person reading this book, right, I, I find, oh, he's, he's, he's helping sort of describe what this thing is doing. Um, in in me, um, and that and that's really really helpful diagnostically, and it's and it's and it's helpful um, uh, to sort of begin to to, to point a way forward. Um, it, yeah, no. yeah, you, you're drawing. Obviously, a lot of your work is, is working in affect now. I just I know you. Yeah, tell tell us a bit about that. What, what's sort of is drawing you in that direction? Why you think affect and, pay, and paying attention to these things is so significant for this work? Yeah, I mean because you know. Um, in some ways, because you know, we need to be able to distinguish um, affects that are that uh, we might tend to think, you know, manifest itself um, in the same way, no matter who is the 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 bearer. For instance, in other words, is the rage of white people the same as black people? Right? We might be tempted. I mean, for for most of our accounting of, of, of race, for instance, you know, we just think it's the same, you know, you know just, you know, no matter who, who bears it. So uh, maybe the actions might be a little bit different, you know, um, but, it, but for some, it's something that to, to, be, to be sort of gotten rid of, to not be allowed in, in public. But there are, certain, there are certain rays that actually is permissible in public, that is actually acceptable, that is actually mainstream. And this is what we saw, 
right? So we see sort of like the fear, you know, and in many ways there's actually a, a misplaced fear is that, you know, that many sort of like, you know, white Americans sort of like have about their place in the world. It is what, you know, some scholars describe, you know, um, is a kind of politics of, of diminished overrepresentation, all right? And so is that, that one, there's a kind of fear that like, while you're already at the center of things, you're already overrepresented, that you actually won't be as overrepresented as you currently are, right? But not recognizing that you're already sort of overrepresented. And so, and so we see that these particular fears that while white supremacy is not reducible to fear, is that we do see, you know, how these fears take on new life because they actually become untethered from reality. And so, and that the capital mobbing and all this kind of stuff, the type of white race that we saw there and, and over the last several years, you know, is now it's affecting the lives of all kinds of white people. White people were not at the Capitol. So now it so now white nationalism, white supremacy of all kinds is is now of it of of a of a of a of a is now a concern. Now is a national security threat. It's always been a national security threat. The ter I mean this country has always been terrorized by by white people. And so well before bin Laden, well before Al Qaeda, right? And so um I mean, slavery was lynch mob. All these was 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 terrorist activity. So now the stuff has come closer to home. It's interrupted our daily lives in some fundamental ways. Now we having to feel. Now we have to figure out how to do that. Whereas when black people engage in certain forms of protest and or in a rage, is actually is 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 immediately sort of quelled by the state. And so all kinds of mechanism operations of, of state repression is is mobilized against. On black and brown people for reasons that we haven't quite really understood and understood, but yet we see that there is a difference. So part of what I'm interested in is what accounts for that difference. Is it just a it's just a mere fact that that these people are white and these people are black who are enraged, and that the state operates and responds differently? Some of that is true, but there's more than that. And so and so in some ways these particular affective uh, affectivities, you know, um, or in some ways represent an, an indicative of certain kinds of like political commitments that that are more acceptable and tolerable than others you know some that are much more sort of uh some commitments that 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 are uh, that are more profitable than others too i mean these listen we we, we need not be mistaken because thurman is clear about this that jesus lived under the roman empire we cannot understate that this is about an imperial regime right and so that when capital not just the u.s capital but when the flow of capital is interrupted in particular sorts of ways right i mean there, there's going to be you know something there's going to be you know put it you know quite frankly hell to pay for some people and not for others and so and and thurman is really trying to i mean this is why he emphasized the fact that jesus is poor right and so like we can't you know questions around sort of like I mean, this would take us into a whole nother conversation, but suffice to say for the moment is that, you know, it's important for us to be able to distinguish between the political actions and activities of one group of citizens from another, right? Even though they might appear to be the same, in reality, they may actually be different, you know? And so, and what's, and what's really remarkable about sort of January the 6th is that it's a particular sort of like political action, really mob, riot, insurrection, like that is born out of fantasy. And so this is what happens like, so that the fear actually leaves you untethered to reality in a very fundamental way, right? And so, and and, and here's the thing, that's actually not black rage. Black rage actually isn't tethered from reality. It's actually a deep intensity is a deep sort of like sensitivity to reality it's not a a break away from reality that's white rage and so like because it doesn't want to come to terms with it with itself and its own sort of like to put it extraordinarily mild you know checker you know history and 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 political sort of actions and policies that have by and large disadvantaged the disinherited yeah. that actually includes here's the thing many white people so that they actually don't actually benefit from the very white supremacist activities and ideologies that they're complicit in that they actually become a victim to it themselves in ways that they don't even realize 
you know, and so that's the kind of incredible sort of like paradox and, and in many ways is a tragedy, you know, that that Thurman is alerting to. That's why we have to, to really be involved in the process of, of self-reflection, being self-critical, right? Because that's the interiority stuff. When you're self-critical, right? If you can't get any purchase on yourself, then how in the world can you get any purchase on the things that are outside of oneself? Like, you know, political positions, elected officials, what they believe, what, you know, policy analysis, all this kind of stuff. And so, so this is why, you know, the kind of the ways in which white supremacy is manifesting itself, you know, to, to the degree to which it, it has, seems to be almost immune from like any kind of self critique. Like there was a moment in time where you could actually reason with white supremacists, right? And so um, like that wasn't that long ago in our history, you know? Now we're at a moment where it seems like we are literally living into, and we've all heard these kinds of sort of analysis and we've all probably experienced in our own way, you know, living in completely different universes and is being, uh, you know, um, in some ways, um, intensified by all kinds of forms of social media that keeps us apart through all these algorithms. Anyway, I can go on about some of, some of the sort of wider sort of like mechanisms that keeps us more and more isolated and more and more entrenched in our own sort of tribe and camps that actually prevents us from being able to see ourselves in a way in which we need to see ourselves to be able to renovate, to do the types of transfer, the self-transformative work that, that needs to take place in order for us to do the type of social trans, transformations that, that we might be interested in. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sensitive to our, to our time and your time in particular, but um, I, we've gotten a couple of questions that I, I think I can weave together here as a sort of final question. Um, one is sort of raising the question of, is heresy a useful category to talk about the substance of white Christianity to enter into theological discourse that way? Or is that inevitably just a sort of po political discourse and we've just seen um, as a political process that so far in America has lost out. American Christianity has been centered around whites, much of American Christianity has been centered around white supremacy or uh, framed by it. The, 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 the sort of landing question I think is very related to that is, should we have hope for Thurman's project? <laughs> Um, is, is there a sort of mystical account of Christianity to which various peoples have and can in the future bear witness? Is Christ ultimately a point of contact for future renderings of faith, um, as, as, as Thurman seems to insist? And I, and I think, it, yeah, it, and, and, and is so invoking the category of heresy may be helpful in making that case. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that's right. I mean, when Jesus become a part of like the dominant, like those who dominate, you know, then we might want to, to start questioning, do we have the right Jesus? Is this a proper interpretation of Jesus? You know, and so I, so I think that should be at least a litmus test. That may, I mean, first, I mean, the heresy question is an interesting question because it's an interesting category because partly what it does, and I know we're right at the limits of the time here, is that heresy almost implicitly, the term tends to imply orthodoxy, right? And so, and, you know, I think heresy is useful in so far as it makes clear that a view it makes clear that a view is um, maybe really sort of abominable or 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 or, or really sort of heterodox or just a moral not, error or something. Yeah. Yeah, but I wouldn't want. I don't. Thurman would not. Well, I don't want to. I mean, Thurman is complicated here, so I don't want to speak too much for Thurman on this point uh, without thinking through a little bit more. But I would just say that that it it could be useful as a maybe in in an internal conversation amongst Christians themselves who might share similar commitments, you know, but Thurman was open to all kinds of religions, you know, and so like, I mean, he, you know, started a church in California where like Christians, Buddhists, like Jews, like we're all worshiping together. So, so, I mean, heresy wouldn't necessarily want, well, he wouldn't necessarily uh, want, probably want to go that far, but he would want to make a, a, a major demarcation and want to be able to talk about what's legitimate something that approaches legitimacy and illegitimacy, you want to have a way of sort of defining or at least um, drawing some, some kind of boundaries, even if those boundaries are porous. And that could maybe look something like the way in which heresy as a concept sort of works. Xavier, thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, it, your, uh, your thoughts and comments have just been so, so helpful. 
um, grateful for this conversation. Thank you for all of our, our folks um, who, uh, who attended today. Um, as I mentioned, this uh, session has been recorded and we'll be um, posting, uh, posting it online. Um, so please uh, share this with someone that you think would uh, find it, uh, would find it uh, helpful. Um, so last time, uh, Professor Pickett, thank you so much for joining us. And so uh, I look forward to a conversation down the, down the road, especially on some of your, your work on affect. Oh, absolutely. I'm happy to talk about that and, and many other things. So feel free to say the word and I'll be more than happy to join you guys at any at any point. All right. Thank, Thank you. you.